I was in Argentina, Bolivia, Panama, Washington, D.C., and I leave tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock for Puerto Vallarta. So <laughs> that gives an idea of what my week's schedule is like. Before I begin, people always want to know what a rabbi is doing on issues of security and tourism security. So I'd like to begin with that and kind of get that off the table. One of the big areas in tourism is um, group tourism. And uh, often one of the complaints, and you hear this in College Station also, is lack of good signage. So I'd like to start off by asking you all a question. Who developed the group tourism industry? Now I'll give you a clue, we're in a church. Well, think about it, I'm a rabbi. I gave you a second clue. Think Moses. He took us on a group tour across the Sinai <laughs> Peninsula. Notice how poor the uh, signage was. If he had gone right instead of left, we would have gotten the oil instead of the sand. So that shows you the importance of it. Now in the same matter, now you should be warmed up. Uh, the cruise industry. Many of you probably have been on a cruise. Who developed the cruise industry? No. You got it. All right, now. If your Hebrew is a little bit bad, uh, on that cruise were a number of people. Noah, which in Hebrew is Noach, which means to veg out. He has three sons who went on the cruise along with their wives. One was known as Yafet, means pretty boy in Hebrew. One is Shem, the world revolves around me, I'm a big deal. And one, in English they call it ham, I can assure you there's no ham in the Bible, is ham. And that basically meant hot, and then a four-letter word a rabbi shouldn't use, starts with an SH, ends with a T, you supply your own vowel. Um, they go on a cruise to nowhere, and uh, does anybody know how the, uh, the story ends? They ended, up on a mountain. they ended up on a mountain, they get off, Noah plants a vineyard and gets drunk, and that's where tourism security begins. So you now know what a rabbi is doing in tourism security. That's the biblical basis of what I do. Uh, so it's my job today to speak to you a little bit about some of the history of terrorism, how it works. Um, I would like to just, I'm going to allow some questions afterwards, but because I work with the State Department, if it's a question I can't answer, I'll just tell you I can't answer it, okay? And you'll understand why I said that. Uh, most people believe that terrorism, or many people think that terrorism started in 9-11. It didn't. It started a long time ago. Terrorism, as we understand it in the modern world, probably began in the 16th century in Germany with what's called the Peasants' Revolt. And that was a revolt that had no peasants and no revolt. But like so much in politics, they knew how to spin in those days too. So um, the name doesn't tell us the real history. But we learned certain things if we study terrorism that are clear no matter where we look in the world. And that's really where I'm going to begin. About 80% of all non-military terrorism, in other words, not actions that are taken against soldiers, but rather terrorism against civilians, tends to take place against people in the tourism industry. That means airlines, hotels, restaurants. I spent time um, last year in Rio working on the World Cup, and I used to have black hair. Um, you can tell. Um, I, I spent time working in the Olympics in 2002 in, in uh, Utah, and 2010 in Vancouver. Uh, those are major events that act almost as magnets so that we have to worry about those things. So let me start off by giving you a little bit of some of the, what I consider to be wrong mistakes about terrorism. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit why terrorism, especially historically, has gone after people in the visitor and tourism industry. So I'm gonna start with what I call three mistakes. Um, and often preparated by the media. The first one is, that the media constantly teaches us that both crime and terrorism happen because of poverty. If we examine the data, we find that's absolutely false. Matter of fact, does anybody know historically what the lowest period of percentage-wise of crime in the United States was? Great Depression. You hit the nail on the head. 
That's right. Crime also went down radically around 2008, what they now call the Great Recession. But this woman was absolutely right. Crime went way down. Now, I'm not saying to lower crime, we all need to be poor. I am saying that crime and terrorism are not dependent on economics. Uh, they are dependent, on the other hand, on lack of morality and ethics. So if we look at the world of crime, I won't even touch terrorism for a second. My grandparents were dirt poor, and they were not criminals. And they had one meal a day during the Depression so their children, my parents, could go to, uh, go to school. On the other hand, we live in Texas. I think we've uh, heard of Enron. Those people were not poor. And yet they were um, what I would not exactly call the most highly moral people on the face of the earth. My point is that often when we look at issues of crime and terrorism, solving the issue of poverty is not going to change the crime statistics. Solving the issue of lack of morality will change crime statistics. And we see lots of poor people who are very good people. And there are lots of rich people who maybe, if they had less good of a lawyer, would be in jail. The second thing that I see all the time and I get is that crime and terrorism come from lack of education. And I have to remind people that education is giving you the skill to do something. You can use physics to make an atomic bomb, or you can use physics to solve a, uh, a, a, a tragedy, whatever that happens to be, or medical physics to uh, solve cancer. That depends on the ethics of the person again. It doesn't depend on the skill. People can have wonderful skill sets and do terrible things. And people can have uh, wonderful skill sets and do wonderful things. I like to remind people all the time, people such as Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein were not stupid. They were evil. They were immoral. But if you can conquer Europe, you're not stupid. And, and we saw actions taken by you can have brilliant madmen. And those are just two examples of a brilliant madman. So just because you've had an education doesn't mean you're tolerant. A matter of fact, does anybody know which group of people were the first supporters of Hitler? The earliest groups of supporters of Hitler were college professors who liked his economic policy. And they said, oh, he doesn't mean the other stuff. Don't take him seriously. They were wrong. Um, but again, education does not lead necessarily to wisdom, nor does it lead to ethics and morality. Third thing we need to understand when we look, now I'm going to go move to uh, terrorism, is I like to distinguish between two types of fights. One I call, um, and I won't use the, the big words like epistemological, et cetera, but we'll just call it a fight over something and a fight over existence. In a fight over something, this lady and I have an argument, and I say, she's eating my cookie. <laughs> and um, she says, no, it's my cookie. And we have an argument, and uh, she convinces me it really is her cookie, or she eats it all. Or I convince her it's my cookie, and she gets, says she's sorry, and she gets me another. But I'm not mad at her. I'm mad we're having a fight over the cookie. There's no question does she exist or not. On the other hand, when we look at fights of existence, often called ontological fights, what I'm saying is, I don't care about her cookie. I want her dead. No matter, I really don't. This is just an example. <laughs> what we're really saying is that I, there is no negotiation. In those cases, you have a different quality. You either win or lose. Now, you might run away, which is another form of losing, or you might die or you might arrest the person, or you might um, kill the person, the opposition. But one way or the other, it's a win-lose. Police departments are win-lose. In other words, you can't go to a police department and say, I'm having trouble paying my mortgage, so I'd like to um, rob a bank. And the police say, no, no bank robberies on Tuesday, but Wednesday's OK. That doesn't exist, OK? The police will say, this is illegal. You can't do it. End of story. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because if we understand some of these basic qualities, 
we can be under, un, begin to understand why terrorism attacks tourism. Let's take a step back. How many of the women in this room ever um, earned any money uh, at a job? Either are earning money or have earned money? Raise your hands. All right, gentlemen, you see the people raising their hands? They are partly responsible for terrorism. Now, before you get too mad at me, let me tell you my wife teaches women's history, and I will get myself out of this hole in about 30 seconds. So just hold on for a bit. But there's an historical reason. Let's look at the history of terrorism and see some of the things that terrorists have traditionally disliked and why they maybe would dislike the United States. First one comes out to exactly what I said about women. In the world of terrorism, we studied from medieval Germany, through Hitler, through the Ku Klux Klan, through um, uh, Middle Eastern terrorists, through Los Senderos y Luminosos, women are always depreciated. You use a woman to get power, and once you get power, you get rid of her. Bye bye, birdie. So, all terrorist organizations, it doesn't matter if you're talking about the Taliban, or you're talking about the terrorists in FARC in Colombia. They'll use a woman to blow something up. They'll use a woman to get power. But once power is obtained, you're out of here. Thank you. You're done. Most terrorist organizations find depreciate women. The Taliban wouldn't let them on the street. What did Hitler do? He created the Lebenhausen, right? If a woman couldn't produce a blonde hair, blue-eyed child, she was worthless. If you look at the history of women in the Ku Klux Klan, if you look at the history of women in any part of the world, a terrorist organization always depreciates um, women. The second thing that they will do, I don't care about you as a person. Terrorist organizations look at groups. In other words, my group is good, your group is bad. So I hate you because you're Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. Whatever my group is, we're the good guys, everybody else is the bad guy. I don't want to get to know you as a person. I don't want to see you as a human being. I want to see you as a number and a group. Thirdly, terrorism is all about the fact that I want the money for myself, the government, but really people in, in the country, the citizens, are money is bad, it's evil. Therefore, I'm going to help you by making you as poor as possible. I'll make you think you're OK, but I'm really, it'll go to me. We'll play a statistical game where it looks like the country's doing great, but you're doing lousy. Next, work is considered to be, eh, really you want to die. That's really the goal. The goal is to get out of this earth and into the next earth. If you think about, for example, in uh, some of the Middle Eastern terrorists, they're interested in what comes in the life after. And that's how you encourage people to uh, be able to go into suicide action. Now, let's begin to look at the world of tourism and why tourism would be so upsetting to terrorists. First of all, tourism is the youngest major industry in the world. In reality, we did not have massive tourism in the world until after World War II. Against the history of the world, that is a relatively very short time. Because it's a very young industry and a very important industry, tourism is believed to generate about $9 trillion a year <coughs> around the world. Now, it's a guesstimate. I want to emphasize that because nobody really knows those numbers. And that's because it's a composite industry. If you count airlines, if I build a road to the airport, is that part of tourism or is that part of road construction? Do I count hotels? Do I count restaurants? So it's how you play those numbers that you'll get you know, a, a different number. But it's the world's largest industry. In the United States, it's the first, second, or third largest industry in every state of the union. Even North Dakota, which is frozen. Um, it's, it's, I hope no one's hearing from North Dakota. Uh, but there's not much there other than the Lawrence Wolf Bubble Museum. Uh, Having said that, even they have tourism as one of their top three industries. Uh, in Texas, it's a major industry. And if we think of football games as part of the tourism industry, 
Anyone who lives in this community knows how big it is. Now let's look at some of the things I just said and what tourism represents. Because tourism is a young industry, it never knew to discriminate against women. The head of our tourism bureau here is a woman. Uh, around the country or around the world where I speak, there are lots of ministers of tourism. Most countries have a ministry of tourism. Uh, and they're women. Uh, we're, no, it doesn't occur to anybody, oh, male or female. There's no make-believe glass ceiling because, it's a, again, it's a new industry. Remember, terrorists don't like women working. Secondly, tourism is all about knowing the other. I can't advertise College Station and say, we have a mall like everybody else. It won't fly. Come to our Dillard's. It's the same as the one in Houston. Nobody will show up. So what do we have to talk about? What makes Aggieland unique? Some of the key things that only we have that somebody else doesn't have. Tourism is all about the other, and about being different. On top of that, in the world of tourism, we don't discriminate. We don't care if you're black, white, Hispanic, Jewish, Catholic, Methodist, Protestant, whatever it happens to be. Your dollar is as good as anybody else's. Again, terrorists want to discriminate. Tourism teaches the idea of learning how to give good customer service, at least in theory, and we're teaching young people entry-level jobs. Now, those are essential, because when a young person is a waiter, he's not learning how to take an order, or she's not learning how to take an order. What they're learning is you come to work on time, you learn how to deal with a customer, you learn how to say you're sorry, you learn how to think on your feet, those are the lessons that will there, that person will take on into other fields later on. The actual, you know, serving somebody a hamburger is very minimal in comparison to all those secondary lessons. Tourism is about making money. Without money, there's no capitalism. Terrorists hate capitalism. Now let's look at, so if we look at the world of tourism, we see a very different world. We see a world that is promoting equality, is saying, vive la différence. Wow, isn't that great? You're from a different country. You know a different language. How do I come up with bilingual menus, or trilingual menus, or quadrilingual menus? How do we work so that we, we're open to the world, and we learn from other people as much as the other way around? All of those are values that terrorists hate. Much of the United States is, think about it, we as historically as a country, I, when people ask me to describe the United States, I say we are the land of the second chance. Because most of us, not maybe you and me, but our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, somebody in our family came here because they had to. Right? In the 17th century, you weren't looking at the United States as a great place to earn a living. You're saying, wow. I was a failure for religion, for fi finance, for politics, whatever it is. And this was the country that gave you that second chance. That's what the Statue of Liberty is all about. This is a country that says, you know what? I don't really care what color you are, or I don't care um, what your national heritage is, or what your religion is. I care about what you contribute to society. Every one of those values are exactly the opposite of the values of the world of terrorism. And so from a terrorist perspective, we, they can't negotiate with us. We can make believe they are. We can choose not to see the world as it is. But the bottom line is, from the perspective of the world of terrorism, the values that I just described are values that we really cannot have. And those are values that the world of terrorism wants to get away with. So. When we travel, we do more than just take a trip. I hope I encourage people to travel all over the world. You're really spreading a little bit of who you are. You're learning about somebody else. You're learning that it's OK if you don't eat at 6 o'clock, because people in Spain eat at 10 o'clock, and the world doesn't come to an end. And you might actually have a good time. It's all right to um, have uh, salad for breakfast in some societies and salad for dinner in other societies. It's OK to have salad after your main course or before your main course. Those are the cultural things that if you're in a garden, you wouldn't want a garden to be all the same flowers. 
and tourism teaches us that the most beautiful gardens are ones with bouquets. So my job is to try to keep you all safe. And let me just give a few quick little t tips of should you travel, things you might want to think about. Principle number one, if you can't afford to lose it, don't take it. That means, don't, if it's something that is um, a, an heirloom, it may not be of great value, but it might be of sentimental value, leave it home. Secondly, don't try to blend in, don't try to be outstanding. Thirdly, do a little bit of research about the world. Lots of times people think, and I hear this all the time, out there or the us and them. No, each one of them, of those thems, is a different country with a different culture. Just like, for example, people say to me all the time, is it safe to come to the United States? I hear it's really dangerous. And, and by the way, statistically it is. But it's not dangerous in College Station. There are some cities and places and cities in the United States where I wouldn't want to walk alone. There are lots of places in the United States where I wouldn't be afraid. But when the media talks about Detroit in the rest of the world, they talk about it as if it's the entire United States. That's not fair and that's not accurate. I have to be in Israel all the time. People say to me, are you safe? You're safer in Tel Aviv than you are in New York City, Houston, or Dallas. But the bottom line is the media takes it and expands it. So one, do a little bit of your own research. Start, if you're going to Costa Rica, learn about it. In Costa Rica, you probably won't have a terrorist attack, but they're not very good when it comes to telling you if the ocean is safe or not. And so I have to deal with people drowning, young American students drowning in the ocean in Costa Rica on a regular basis. I just read the Riot Act to the Minister of Tourism two weeks ago. You paid for it. And said, he said, we're going to lose money. I said, yes, but I'm tired of having young American lives drown. And I'd rather have you lose the money than us lose a person. We can replace your money. I can't replace a, a, a student. But that's a different, but it doesn't matter if you die from a wave or you die from a bomb, you're dead. <laughs> so learn what it is. If you're traveling and you're a man, don't put your wallet in your back pocket. Put it in your front pocket with two rubber bands around it. It's the safest thing you can do. You guess what? You won't get robbed. And easy, two rubber bands, go to the post office, they'll give you the two rubber bands cheap, or you can go to Walmart. Uh, try to, uh, don't walk with a map, and don't walk with a camera. On the other hand, get directions before you go. Now, tourism is, I think, one of the great ways for us to bring the world together. If you're open and you're not, and a little bit flexible, you can have a wonderful time. Last Monday I was in uh, Buenos Aires, Things got fouled up. I was stuck in the airport for 13 hours. So I met some cops. I said, hey, I'm here for 13 hours. Tell me about Argentina. And they took me on a tour of all their, uh, uh, all their protection agencies. I ended up leaving with five new friends. That's what I mean by being flexible. Whatever experience you have in life, it's more than what you had. So if you go to and see the world with an open eyes, a sense of, wow, each one of us is unique and special, then I think we really have a great way of seeing the world. I like to tell people in uh, Genesis, we're told that each of us is made B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. By the way, that same word, Selim, gives the Hebrew word Matzlema for, ta uh, for a, a, a camera. We're each made in the image of God, but God was smart enough to make each one of us an individual. Go out, see some of those other images. We're only on this earth, to the best of my knowledge, once. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.